Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about the challenges of running a financially stable nonprofit during the pandemic with guests, Eric Anya, Chief Financial Officer of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and Eileen Frazier, Chief Administrative Officer of the National School Board Association. Thank you both for joining. Um, I was so interested in having this discussion. We're going to have a technical discussion, but it's going to be really fascinating. It is not just for the accountants among us and the, uh, and the numbers folks. This is really about how do you create organizations that are solid, that can survive the pandemic, that have the wherewithal to execute missions. And we wanted to try and get two very unlike organizations because they're are ways in which your disciplines are very similar, but they're executed in different ways to, you know, in different areas of the country in order to affect civil society. So Eric, let's start off with you. Let's, let's talk about sort of your career arc that brought you here and talk about managing finances at an organization that can open partially, is not able to welcome as many guests um, as normal, has to do what we're all doing, dealing with this uh, Zoom technology. How do you maneuver during this time? Thank you, Mark. Um, just a quick snapshot. I, as, as Mark said, I'm Chief Financial Officer at the Hust Museum of Finance Houston. Um, have been in the position for most of the last seven years. And prior to that, was Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the Art Institute of Chicago. So I've had the good fortune uh, to be in two large museums in the cultural sector. Um, just in terms of the pandemic, I think when you look at the cultural sector, it's not homogeneous. I think that there are differences. And if I think of the performing arts, for example, the ballet, the theater, uh, the grand opera, I think their issues are substantially more severe uh, than the museum space because um, in their case, they have fi fixed seating, whether it's auditoriums, uh, and we all know the, the emphasis has been on indoors. Uh, indoors with fixed seating, uh, somewhat problematic. Uh, they have had like, other cultural institutions curtailed capacities. And even if they have guests who want to visit, uh, at some point, those curtailed capacities may not match their financial ambition. In other words, it may cost more to put on a production than you get with the curtailed capacity. So I think those areas seem to have had the worst. Plus, uh, you know, when you're talking about performing arts, the artists need to exercise their skills in order to stay sharp. If you're a dancer, you need to perform, you need to rehearse, you need to interact in order to have the sharpest kind of skills. Plus, you're interacting with the audience. You know, exactly. as wonderful as as a, a work of art is, it's not interacting with you in terms of receiving your feedback and then trying to give back. It 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 is what it is, right? Whereas yeah. When you're, when you're talking about the performing arts, the, the, um, the challenge is, is so much there. But let's, let's talk a little bit. We're going to come back to, um, to how you're structured in terms of your finances and how uh, it, it functions. But Eileen, uh, talk about how your career arc has unfolded and how you ended up where you are. Absolutely. So um, just uh, several years, a little bit about me. I'm an accountant by trade. Um, but I've spent probably the last uh, 15 or 20 years in the uh, chief operating, chief administrative officer space. Uh, I am currently the chief administrative officer of the National School Boards Association. Uh, but prior to that, I spent 25 years working at the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington, which is a philanthropy uh, with an endowment. So I actually have a good uh, base of knowledge in the philanthropic and uh, association world. Um, National School Boards Association, uh, all of our school boards are really on the front lines uh, of the, in our local communities of everything we're doing today, trying to get to the other side of the pandemic. Um, although there's always a, there has been, an, and you can see the national conversation about, uh, about schools and kids, uh, it's the local school boards, it's the elected representatives that are establishing the policies that are going to allow our kids to get back into schools if they haven't gotten back already. Um, and that's created a, a significant challenge in the education sector. The pandemic um, has needed to have each of these school boards and districts all make decisions about how they pivot in this new world. Um, and parallel to that, really trying to transform at the same time. 
uh, it's like uh, changing a tire on a moving bus um, and then having the transmission fall out and we need to fix that simultaneously. Uh, and in, in that space, uh, NSBA has really focused on that transformation. We launched a program called Public Schools Transformation Now to really help focus those, the school boards on that. And a really important piece of the work we're doing is also related to uh, the systematic racism as well as uh, structural inequities that come in the public school sector. Um, and so we've launched another program called Dismantling Institutional Racism in Education. Uh, the short and acronym is DIRE, D-I-R-E. Um, and we're really focused on how to, how to match hybrid learning, remote learning, in-person classes to, to really get to the other side of the, the pandemic. What I think is so interesting is how you both talk about your roles as administrative officers, as finance officers, in mission terms. So you don't see, Eileen, that you are separate from the programs that you describe, and you, Eric, also, right? You're not separate, you're integrated into it. You are enablers of those programs. Talk a little bit about how, let's, let, let's start with Eileen now, uh, talk a little bit about how you assure that the infrastructure is uh, scaled and sufficient, particularly during this PPP uh, time where everybody is trying to figure out how we're going to navigate that aspect um, for your organization to pursue its mission. Sure. You know, the first thing that I think uh, as the ops person, the admin person, the financial person, you need to make sure the infrastructure is strong enough to, to survive for the future. And so what that means is immediate pivoting and relooking at budgets. Um, I'm sure that every nonprofit has focused on that. But the pieces of the puzzle that I've noticed uh, throughout the year, especially related to the PPP program, which I really want to highlight, um, it's something I've spent a lot of time focusing on. Um, I know a lot of the guidelines and the, and the legislation. I could be helpful to others if they need it. Um, is that many have shied away. Boards, even boards of directors have said, we're not at the brink of disaster, and therefore we shouldn't, we shouldn't draw on the PPP program. I would tell people to really look seriously about not getting to the, when we only have one day of cash left. At that point, you've already set up the fact that you aren't gonna survive the, the, to the next day. In accounting terms, that's called a going concern. You never want to be a going concern. You, you need to prepare for the future. And that means really looking seriously at all forms of revenue, um, including insurance claims for that matter. So you basically did two things. First of all, you looked at your budgets for, uh, and your financial circumstance now given the new circumstance in which we are operating. So there will, there will be adjustments in terms of how you operate. The second thing you did is you equipped yourself as an expert in PPPs so that you could take advantage of that program, become knowledgeable in how to apply. And one of the things you're doing as you're talking to your constituents, including the people here on this program, is to urge them to apply early, get their ducks in a row so that they are strong in terms of going forward. They're, they're ensuring the stability of their organizations as well, right? Absolutely, and just as a, a kind of additional piece of information, the PPP program closes for all first draws on March 31st. Uh, so the time is ticking, and if you really haven't applied yet, please consider it, uh, especially if you're in a space where you have lost some significant amount of revenue, uh, you will need it before the end of the pandemic is completed. Eric, how did you prepare? I, I know you looked at your budgets as well because we're working with the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, but how, all, how else did you prepare for this? Because you also, you're in a different state, you have a different circumstance, you were partially open, partially closed at certain times, you had to deal with fewer guests. Um, what did you do to ensure that you could operate at this uh, reduced capacity, but also robustly? So I would say that the, the first challenge was what Eileen talked about, which you mentioned, which is just looking at in the beginning of the pandemic, the, there was a huge amount of uncertainty. You know, how long is this going to be? Uh, what does that mean? And I think now we have a good sense with vaccines online, we have a good sense as to uh, timeline. And the issue in, at the beginning was just opening the museum safely. It sounds like a, it sounds like a long time ago, but at that point, 
we had a task force assembled. I was part of the task force to come up with mechanisms and protocols that make sure the museum is safe for our guests and for our staff. And we continue to, to enforce those, including weekly testing for our staff. I think we're one of the only museums doing that right now uh, at a hugely expensive rate, but we feel that's tremendously important to guarantee safety and transparency. So that's one. And then longer term, the, the bigger challenge for us has been as an organization with some means with a large endowment is figuring out what's a transitory change and what's a structural change as a result of the pandemic. It's not often as easy as people think. Some changes are things that you know uh, will return to uh, you know, ex ante pandemic, pre-pandemic levels in our operations. That would be fine. Other changes we are struggling with to figure out what does it really mean? What does it mean if you have a film theater? Does it mean that people will return or are people so used to Netflix that they'll be happy to stay at home and you have permanent loss in cap capacity? Uh, what does it mean for a parking garage? Does it mean that when you reopen and reach full capacity, the parking garage will be at capacity or are people working from home and will never return? So I think for us, that's been the challenging aspects. And I think of myself more as a, a sort of a chief strategy officer working with various programs to figure out where that link is and what we think short term versus what we think long term. I see you nodding, Eileen. You're, you also embrace this idea of finance being about strategy, it's about the invisible hand that enables the work to proceed, right? Uh, yes, and, 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 I, and my position on that generally is that if you're in the chief financial, chief operating, chief administrative officer, any of those C-suite uh, operations team members, at the end of the day, if you're, if you're not about the strategy of the organization moving forward, and if you're not part of that and you're only looking at the dollars and cents there will never be a good synchronization of your c-suite team and one of the actually the points that i had written down for myself was that that's also a key piece of the puzzle it's making sure you have the right people in the right seats on the on the bus to be able to deliver those results together especially in in a world that's pivoting and changing so quickly one of the things that we just asked in our, in our poll, which is just completed, is how long will it take to uh, recover, uh, for nonprofits to recover financially after this pandemic and economic crisis? And 57% of the, of the respondents said about two to three years, 43% uh, up to five years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that seemed to be the, the constraint on the responses. Um, how do you feel that this is going to affect you? Well, because Eric, that was a very interesting point you made about sort of looking at changes that the pandemic uh, engenders in our human behaviors in your institution, and then looking at maybe that will actually have an impact on how you use your capital assets, your buildings, your theaters, and so on. And Eileen, I, I know the technology is, is huge, right? I mean, that's how everybody's meeting now. Uh, for you, what kind of permanent changes are you planning for, Eric, uh, beyond the theater piece in terms of that might affect your competencies, how you put people together um, for your uh, organization and ensure that you're, you're going forward it, with a kind of a self-adjusting, elegantly adjusting institution to serve your clientele? One, um, one advantage we have um, going with the pandemic, the only, I would say, advantage is that we opened a new building uh, during the pandemic, which was uh, extremely challenging, but uh, we are so grateful to have our chief operating officer lead the charge and do a tremendous job. And this was just ju just for uh, audience members who aren't familiar, the museum, uh, the uh, Fine Arts Museums of Houston has really completely re uh, re revised its campus. It's it's opening up now. It's It's mm -hmm. Uh, just an amazing transformation that has been engendered. And it's been engendered with a kind of an, an elegant under the covers approach, right? Well, I'm glad you said that because it has been, but it's been enormously successful. But that provided an opportunity because part of that expansion always involved more staff, but we hadn't hired the staff, you know? So, so one of the advantages we have versus other institutions is that we can make those adjustments prospectively. As we see things develop, we can adjust our staffing levels prospectively without cannibalizing or doing anything with our existing staff. That's a huge advantage we have, um, I think, vis-a-vis -vis many other institutions. Um, in the same way, when you think about forward thinking, I think some of our things like our membership, as you would expect, which is very transactional, 
what we've seen is a substantial decline. It will take some time to build up that framework. I don't expect it to be, you know, again, a snap of the fingers and the members will return. I think it will take some time as they see our programs and as they see that they can come back to the museum safely. And so we're making those assessments on across the whole organization. What do we think will happen as the audience says, three to five years, over five years, what's permanent and what's not. And it, it's too early to say, I must say, I think we're still in the process of building infrastructure type thought process and figuring out is it what we should we do? And we're working towards it with our next budget cycle in mind. But I have to say it's still a work in progress and it's still too early for us to make the complete assessment. I think it's so interesting because Eric, what you're basically saying is that you as you and finance are thinking about physical facilities, gallery spaces, how those galleries are interacting with the visitors. You're actually uh, part of this process that is usually considered uh, a curatorial or a program or an exhibition uh, idea. You're also looking at competencies of staff right? Because you're, you have yet to hire so many people. So you're thinking about what kind of competencies are required in the organization in order to advance the mission. So you're really getting involved in a very uh, team-oriented way, not in a siloed way with how the organization unfolds. Eileen, are you also involved in all sorts of staff uh, decisions in terms of, of how the organization shapes itself going forward? in terms of the thinking and the technical competencies and all these other elements, even if they're not part of your group? Absolutely. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to highlight that uh, Eric said is that in some, ways it's a, in some ways it's a little too soon to make some of those decisions. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier the, the program Public uh, School Transformation Now, and that's really designed to look at the indiv individual needs of each child. Um, and in that situation, I would say that the, the word of the day, I think in almost everything we are thinking about is hybrid. And I know that's today overused and maybe cliche, but looking, looking at how we match that both in uh, the work we do in our public schools, but as well as our members, um, there are things that are much more efficient um, in, in um, the COVID times using Zoom for national uh, quick hour to, or two hour meetings um, and, and other things like that, that I think will stick pretty easily and quickly. And then areas where really getting together and, and, and having robust conversation and discussion about important advocacy needs of the education community are things that, are, that we hope will be in person very soon. So in terms of, in terms of how you see um, this pandemic working out, there are some going to be some permanent changes. There are also going to be a lot of things that, that, um, that are going to be the same. So let's talk about the long-term financial health of these organizations beyond the pandemic and how you feel these functions ought to be shaped and how you are shaping them to be very modern functions. Right? If you go back in history, very often the administrative side or the uh, CFO side um, was seen as having a very discreet role. You do your thing, you use your technical competencies and we'll, we'll carry forward the mission. Everything that we've discussed today shows that that isn't the way things are, but there is still competencies that are specific to your function. There's still a chain of command. How do you, how does, how do these organizations, how should they actually be shaped to allow for the proper balance of communication amongst departments, right? But also focus and not have, you know, a committee of the whole have to assemble in order to have every decision made. How do you actually um, work, Eric, at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston to promote efficiency and cooperation and communication? So I think the key word is communication. So in our organization, we have a board of trustees and as everybody does, and we have a finance committee, we have an executive committee, and there is a direct line of clear uh, communication and expectation between the officers, and there are five officers of the corporation that make a number of the administrative executive decisions, and the board. So start with that. So your point is that it starts actually with the governance entity. Absolutely. Right? That's, very, that's a very interesting point, how that governance works and how it communicates, and the governance 
entities respect for the for the chain of command within the staff, but also their clear role as you know in the various committees and how they they oversee the organization. That also is very important, is what you're saying. Yeah, and I think that's the key. So so there's a level of commitment and a level of transparency between the management team and the trustees first, and a level of clear expectation of what the trustees, as, as the guarantors of the institution and as the ultimate people responsible, uh, expect. And then it flows downhill. It flows from there to the rest of the staff. And at the museum, I have to say, we do something very unique. After every board meeting, just for level of transparency, we have 600 employees all welcomed to watch the same presentation and we repeat the same presentation we give the board to the staff. And we do that five times a year and we've started doing it again with the pandemic uh, when we have an executive committee meeting. And the rationale is to have that level of transparency so that everybody feels we're matching towards the same end result and have a clear cut uh, objective as to what the trustees expect. Uh, so I think that's where it starts. And then individuals like myself, I look at myself as a strategic partner to the various aspects and how we do we deliver that with our partners? Uh, that's a different story, but it really all starts from the governance aspect. And, and it, it speaks of superb management practice, superb governance practice. These practices are not unfamiliar to you, Eileen, and you've, you've worked in a number of different organizations, right? It's not, this is not about the Museum of Fine Arts Houston only, right? This is really about good governance practice in the nonprofit sector. Absolutely, it, I would highlight two things Eric said, uh, uh, the words he used, trust and respect. Those two pieces of the puzzle are really important and all communication flows from those two, two, two tenants from, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's interesting, um, if you get past a lot of the pieces that Eric talked about about the governance, I would say, when you look inside the organization at the C-suite, which um, it, it's all about trusting each other in their own swim lanes and outside of your swim lanes, right? It's about knowing that there's certain things that, like I'll use the PPP program as an example, that where my team knows that I know and that I'm just gonna keep driving forward on it. And, and I know that. And then there are areas where if I don't get advice and counselor and they don't get mine, the work doesn't flow the way it needs to. And that's the piece of the puzzle that comes from trust and respect. That, that, that's how communication flows freely. And I think that all of us are striving to, to communicate better, but with that baseline, you have a, a chance. One of the things that we, we asked in the last poll is, uh, is how during the pandemic, uh, the government support should flow. And we got some very interesting answers. We asked should nonprofits receive more support. Now, most of the people who attend this and, and are responding are associated with the nonprofit sector. They come from business, government, and nonprofit uh, arenas, but they, but they um, are associated with nonprofits. 19% said nonprofits should receive uh, more support. 2% said business should receive more support. But the really interesting response for me was that both, was the response that both should receive the same type of support based on common criteria, things like number of employees, financial need, and so on and so forth. So the whole idea is that the 501c3 designation, the tax code designation, really doesn't distinguish a nonprofit from a business. A nonprofit is a nonprofit business, and a and a what we call a business is really a for-profit business. They're both businesses. Do you both uh, view? From your perspective as administrative officers of various types, do you see that the, that this is really a lot of commonality between these sectors? Uh, Eileen, let's start with you. So, I, uh, as if people who know me well know, I answer yes and no a lot, and I'm going to answer that que this question that way as well, because I would say that absolutely, if you use kind of the bottom level support and are we a business or not, absolutely we are. But there is also a partnership between the nonprofit sector and the government sector that people that are not part of the nonprofit sector don't um, understand as well of a, as a, us those work, work in it. And what I mean by that is there are, there are needs that are filled by the nonprofit sector that are not profit oriented business operations that we need to make sure as a community we, we focus on. And that's the, that's, the, that's the yes and no, the yin and the yang 
of the answer to that question as far as I'm concerned. So what you're saying is you are required, like government sometimes, to do things that are financially nonsensical in terms of your own profitability. You have to spend money where they, you, you get no return, right? which a business could not do. You really have to think about this purpose that you have, which is not to create shareholder value. It's to be financially stable, but for a particular civil society purpose. So yes and no again, because yeah. actually it's, it's an inverted equation. If you work in a for-profit business and you are the owner of a business and your business has a net income of 7%, you, and that 7% is yours as the owner or the shareholders or whoever, you are excessively ha happy about that, depending on the size of the business, obviously. A 7 to 10% profit ratio is pretty darn good. In a nonprofit, we are held to the standard that your operations, your admin costs, and your, all of your overhead needs to be at, most people want it at six to seven to 10%. The, the Better Business Bureau says up to 25%, but that means you're only spend, that you're spending 75% or that's your profit ratio. And that's the, in, in, in my equation, the difference. It's an inverted equation on what you're delivering versus what the profit should be on that on that product, regardless of what it is. Interesting, interesting. Eric, could you answer the same question about whether you see the division between a business? So, for example, if I'm running a theater chain or a concert um, business or uh, any type of exhibition business, and I'm a for-profit business. And, and you're a nonprofit business, how do you see the distinctions there in terms of how you have to operate? I look at it somewhat like Eileen, maybe slightly differently. I think in terms of competence, in terms of processes, in terms of protocols, in terms of personnel, you can see there's been a match that was professionalizing not-for-profits, starting with universities and across the, across the spectrum now. And hence, you see the kinds of compensation that happens in not-for-profits, right? You see it all the time. But fundamental to a not-for-profit is an underlying mission. And I think we say that, and, and obviously, somebody says, you know, mission without resources means nothing because you, you'll be bankrupt and you'll be out of business. But I will tell you that when I look at my role and I think about this many, many times, there are clearly decisions that we make that have no financial benefit. If you just look at it strictly finite from a financial perspective okay. for us none, but are hugely important from a mission perspective. Uh, there are many works of art we acquire that if you just looked at the balance sheet, you'd say, why? But there are multiple reasons why we do it. And we go through a certain process to, to justify that to ourselves, that we are meeting the mission. So I, I cannot believe they are the same. And frankly, you know, Eileen talked about the P PPP. We also have a short act venue operating grant program that's just come up with the second COVID uh, bill. And this issue, there's for-profits and not-for-profits that could be eligible for it. And even in the application process, it's being administered by the SBA, there aren't rules yet. But in looking at potential rules, you can start to see where there's variance and where they cannot necessarily be treated exactly the same, right? Because there are differences in just what the objectives of each institution are. A little more nuanced, I think, than one or the other. You know, it, it, it's, such a, it's such a good point. Um, you you really, it, and it does connect to your previous point, Eric, about communication and making sure that everybody's rowing in the same direction. That idea that you that, that you are required to do certain things for your civil society purpose that a business wouldn't necessarily take into account is a very powerful issue. But but then you also have to question yourself because if you're going to be investing in something that isn't going to necessarily financially strengthen the organization, you really do have to uh, ensure, don't you, Eileen, that, that your constituents, particularly if you're an association, are also in alignment. It's not one person's decision and you're leaving your constituents behind, right? Absolutely, and that's, uh, that really focuses back on the conversation we had, and, and Eric mentioned about the governance and the, and the focus on good go governance, because at the end of the day, um, interestingly, NSBA, National School Boards Association, is a 501c3, so we are a, a public charity, but that's because we are association of associations. Um, our our uh, 49 members are also are all 
national, uh, local state school boards that are also um, 501c3s. And so our members are really important to uh, come together and, and agree uh, to the same source of focus so that we can deliver them together. And that's a really important uh, piece of the work with, that we do. I'm going to give you the last uh, word, Eric, since we've come to the end of our time. Um, we just completed a poll in which we asked which nonprofit sectors will struggle the most to recover. And the arts were viewed as being very, very stressed by this, by this time. What can we all do to help the arts um, uh, make it through this time of struggle and, and on all arts? Yeah, and I think you've hit it. I think the arts are going to be stressed, clearly. Uh, you can see it in multiple ways. But I actually do think um, the pandemic in a very strange way, long term, five, 10 years, uh, certain institutions will be strengthened because it will enable us to look at some of our protocols and our practices and plan for the long term. Uh, what people can do most is be supportive. You know, your five bucks, your 10 bucks, your annual contribution uh, helps tremendously. And so if you're a member of these institutions, they will be back. Um, and it, it's incumbent on all of us to support and, and to realize that there's more to the arts than just, uh, uh, that, that they are instrumental in a society and, and provide a place of solace, a place of you know, meditation, a place of education. Uh, they have a real role for society. And so everyone should look at it that way prospectively and just, just hang in there. Uh, and, and be, be contributory uh, to your various organizations. So your, your admonition to us is get involved, yeah. attend. If we can't attend in person, find something online that you love, attend, give a, give a little, um, uh, get involved. And Eileen, that's the same for every organization, isn't it? If you, if you get involved in your schools, get involved in your schools. It's really about us, isn't it? It's about our involvement. Absolutely. So, and no, I, I just wanted to say, look, uh, I, I said this up front, but I want to kind of say it on the back end as well. Um, I want to uh, first uh, thank you, but also to uh, really uh, focus on the front lines of our kids and the schools. Uh, they are so important to our future. And also, I would actually make the link between uh, Eric's role in his organization and NSBA and that you know, a piece of education is always the arts and we need to keep and make sure that that's part of uh, how we move forward as well. Well, thank you both, uh, Eric. Uh, Eric Anya of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Eileen Frazier, uh, the Chief Administrative Officer of the National School Board Association. Thank you so much for helping attendees. Thank you for coming. Uh, as I said, uh, on Tuesday, we have uh, the Consumer Reports team here, a very fascinating show. We all know what Consumer Reports is. Now we'll get the inside dough. Everybody stay safe. That's the nonprofit report for today. And we'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yeah.